Welcome everybody. It's 6.30 and so we're going to start. I'm Elizabeth Weilbacher. I'm the head of adult services at the Gosstown Public Library and we are delighted to have you all here. Thank you. I'm not going to go into any long introduction of Tony Trembley, the man who you all know, who's just written this book. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Between the allergies uh, and everything else that's going on, my throat's a little raw. So if you can't hear me, just yell and I'll speak louder. Okay back there? <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, uh, Gosstown Public Library, for having me here. It really is an honor. Uh, the Gosstown Library really does support its community. Uh, and it's, it supports its authors. So I, I can't thank them enough for, for inviting me here. Before I start, I, I do want to pick out a few people in the audience uh, that I'm very grateful uh, for showing up, for coming. Uh, first guy right here, uh, he's a celebrity. And his name is Christopher Golden. And he's the New York Times best-selling author of Ararat. And his new book out, uh, Road of Bones is climbing the charts. It's a huge book. Uh, and you may see movies of some of his books soon. Uh, Chris is... Tony, we're here to talk about your book. Chris has been, <laughs> Chris has been a mentor. He's been a friend. Uh, just an invaluable guy uh, to, to have around. And I, I really love the guy and I appreciate him being here. Uh, the other one I want to, the other guy right behind him <laughs> is John McElveen. Uh, you couldn't ask for a better friend. Uh, he is my publisher, and I'm going to talk a little bit about both of these guys uh, <laughs> in a little bit uh, uh, once I get going. But uh, if it wasn't for Mac, I wouldn't be here right now. So I owe Mac an awful lot. And he says, now you don't owe me anything, but I do. I owe Mac an awful lot. And thank you for coming. Uh, there's a few uh, people here from my writers group. Sandy and Robert. Robert's out back. Sandy's out front here. I want to thank them for coming. Uh, they've been invaluable as far as support and motivation goes. And I'll talk a little bit about them also. I'm going to start telling you just a little bit about me, uh, and then I'll get into the books and uh, how I've written them or, or what's behind them. Uh, I was born in Manchester, which is the next town over. Uh, it's about a 10, 15 minute ride from here. And I moved to Gosstown. 45 years ago. I guess that still doesn't make me a, a, a townie, but uh, it gets close. Uh, for 10 of those years, I worked in, in Manchester at a company called Goldbond Building Products. And Goldbond made vinyl siding for all over the world, uh, the world all over the United States uh, and Canada. And when I worked at Goldbond, uh, the first five years they were terrible, absolutely bad. Uh, we lost a lot of money. A couple guys went to jail. Uh, I, was, I, I was the only person that was left in the management. Uh, they let everybody else go and they kept me. And for the next five years, we did great. And it's not because of me, it's because of the support we had. But we did really good. In fact, we did so good, the company that uh, owned us said, hey, we're going to move you down south because electricity is cheaper, labor is cheaper. We're going to make a lot more money. Now, I'm a New England boy. There's no way I'm going down south, and I didn't go. Uh, I went somewhere else. But just to, uh, just to let you know what happened, they moved to a place, a place in Mississippi, uh, and they closed the plant two years later. Uh, so you get what you pay for. Uh, and it's unfortunate for the people that did move down there, but that's the way it is. So I, I was the production manager when I was at uh, Goldbond, and then I went to a company called New England Plastics, and they were in Woburn, Mass. Uh, Woburn, Mass. If you're from around here, you say you really went to Woburn, Mass every day, and I did. It's a 90-minute commute. So every day for 35 years, I traveled three hours a day to go to work. Uh, I'm going to ask, what did you listen to on the radio on the rides there? <laughs> <laughs> I listened to uh, a lot of Neil Young. I'm a huge Neil Young fan. But all the regular things that people listen to. And then finally I got serious radio. And then I got everything. And I was a news junkie and I listened to news. I listened to a lot of things. But I worked there for 35 years and I was the vice president of manufacturing. Uh, when you're a vice president of a small company, it means you wear a lot of different hats. Uh, I did sales, I did marketing, I was HR, did the hiring, and I was in charge of the plant. I did, I did it all. Uh, and I did that for 35 years until I retired three years ago. Uh, 
people say, hey, do you miss anything about work? And I really liked the job. I, I loved it a lot. Uh, but what I didn't miss was that commute. Uh, I, I can't, to this day, I think about traveling all that distance back and forth every day. And, you know, my neck stiffens and my back hurts. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not much fun. I saw a lot of bad things happen. Uh, I was in one accident. I was okay, but I was in one accident during those 35 years. But I saw a lot of really bad ones. Uh, and I'm glad it's over and I'm glad it's done. So while I was at Gold Bond, while I was at Wingland Plastics, I really didn't do much writing. Uh, I didn't do any fiction writing at all. Uh, but I wanted to. I always wanted to since I was a kid. Uh, I think when, oh gosh, I was about 10 years old, I wrote a horror story called uh, Spiders Ate My Face. <laughs> and I, I showed it to my dad, who promptly cut it to pieces. And uh, that stifled my writing career for a long time. Uh, but I always wanted to. I always wanted to write. And uh, about 10 years ago, a co-worker said to me, hey, you know, the Gosstown Library has a writer's group. I said, really? She said, she said I know you like to write. And if you saw my inter-office memos, <laughs> they, they were always an interesting story. There's always a lot of fun to those. And she said, I know you like to write. You ought to go and take a look. So I did. And I tell you, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Uh, the group was fantastic. It was a small group. There was about eight to ten people. But more importantly, they were a critique group. If your critique group is when you send your submissions in, they go over it word by word, line by line, sentence by sentence, and they cut the crap out of it. I mean, they really tear that thing up. Uh, and there's a reason for that. It's to make you a better author. And I'll tell you, my first couple of submissions, they cut those up. I mean, they were bad. Uh, but again, I learned from those. So I kept at it and kept at it. And finally, I, I came up with the story that I thought was pretty good, and they did too. And it was called An Alabama Christmas. So at the time, I was uh, a member of a, web, a website called Horror World. And uh, there's a lot of fans of horror fans and a lot of horror authors on, on Horror World. And they said, uh, I said to them, hey, I wrote this great story, Alabama Christmas, and you know, I'm hoping somebody will publish it somewhere. And there's a guy in, of all places, Australia, emails me and says, do you mind if I read that story? And I said, sure. So I sent him the story. He emails me back a couple days later and says, I love it. The story is fantastic. I'm, I'm making an anthology. I'd really like to, to put it in there. I'm like, sure. You know, my first story, I couldn't believe it. So he said, I'll get back to you. So I waited, and I waited. <laughs> About three months go by, and I finally got the nerve up to say, hey, uh, you know that story that you said uh, you were going to publish? He goes, I've been meaning to talk to you. <laughs> he goes, a very famous horror writer, uh, very well respected, sent in a novella. Well, we're going to take it because of who it is. Uh, and I had to let somebody out of the anthology. And you're the new guy. You know, we, uh, we had to pick somebody near it. So I was devastated. And I know somebody's asking, who was the guy? Who's the guy? It was Tom Piccarilli. And there's no way I can complain that somebody took a Tom Piccarilli novella over my short story. But I went on uh, back on Horror World and I said, geez, you know, uh, I, my story didn't get published. And the owner of the website, Nancy Calantha, said, hey, can I read the story? And I said, sure. And I sent it to her. And she loves it. She came back and said, I'm going to publish this story for you. I said, that's fantastic. And she says, I'm also going to pay you for it. I said, oh. I said, how much? $250. Now, I'm like, $250 for a story. I'm going to make tons of money. I'm going to keep writing stories, and I'm going to get all this money. You know, I, I have it. You know, I, I get this down. So I kept writing stories, and I, and I wrote a bunch of stories. Uh, and I wrote one called The Old Man that I really liked. Uh, keeps nodding his head because th there were good stories. <laughs> uh, I wrote The Old Man. And I sent it out, and it got rejected a couple of places. So I was kind of dejected. And I went to a uh, conference called Nikon, which is a, a convention that in, was in uh, Rhode Island. Now it's in Massachusetts, where a lot of horror authors and fans went to. It's more fans than authors, actually. But uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a good place to go. And I met a woman there. And she, we got to talking. And she said, do you write? And I said, yeah. And uh, she said, do you have anything? And I said, well, I have this story called The Old Man that been rejected twice. It's not really horror. It's a crime story. And she goes, let me read it. 
and she read it and she came back and said, you know, I'm publishing this book called Epitaphs. I want to publish The Old Man and Epitaphs. I'm thinking, this is fantastic, you know, my second story. I said, great. She says, I'm going to pay you for it. And I went, oh, wow. She goes, $25. <laughs> and I'm, I'm there, okay, $250, $25. Of course I said yes. I mean, I, I wanted the story published. But, you know, I learned something that, <laughs> from that. Uh, new writers don't make a lot of money. And actually $25, $50 back then was about the average that uh, new writers got paid for stories. It didn't stop me. I just kept writing and writing. I kept submitting stories to the writers group and they would help me and I'd write some on my own. Well, eventually I got, I think it was about 20 stories published. Some were overseas, some were in anthologies, some were on websites. I thought I had enough for a collection. So I, I called some, a friend of ours, uh, the two friends actually, the Davids from Crossroad Press. I think they're in North Carolina. And uh, I said, hey, I got, all these stories, would you mind putting them together for a collection? And they said, sure, you know, let's send it down, let's take a look at it. And they did, and they loved the stories. So the stories came out in a book called The Seeds of Nightmares. I know you guys can't see it back there, but The Seeds of Nightmares. Funny thing happened when that came out. It did very well. <laughs> it shocked the heck out of me. Uh, the Seeds of Nightmares, when it came out, was in the top 10 anthology books in horror the day it was released. Uh, yeah, and I think that's because I, I think I knew enough people online, I had enough friends uh, that they bought it, and they started talking about it beforehand, and then the reviews started coming in, and the reviews were great. Uh, I was just tickled pink. Uh, just all, People were buying this anthology, and it was doing very, very well. Uh, so I thought, you know, kind of nice to have these checks coming in. I'm, I think I'm going to keep writing short stories. So then one day out of the blue, a man by the name of Christopher Golden reaches out to me and says, hey, me and a guy by the name of uh, Jim Moore, who's a well-respected and uh, very popular horror author, are putting together a class. And it's a, it's a seminar on how to write better fiction. He said, Tony, you know, I, I think you might get something out of this class. Would you like to join it? I said, absolutely. You know, who doesn't want to learn how to write better? So I said, okay, and I signed up for it. So about three weeks before the first class, there was a book reading. It was somewhere in Massachusetts uh, by a, a man named Bracken McLeod, who's another, I consider him a famous author, but a very well-respected author. And I met Jim, Chris's partner, uh, at the book signing, and Jim said, hey, Tony, let's go to lunch. This guy's my hero, right? I'm, uh, okay. <laughs> so I, I, I went to lunch with, uh, with Jim. So we're sitting there, and he looks at me, and he goes, uh, for the class, can you tell me what kind of horror novel you're writing? And I went, excuse me? And he said, horror novel, what's the class? You know, write better fiction. And I said, I, I thought it was short stories. He goes, no, it's, it's novels. And it's my fault. I didn't look at the fine print. I just signed up and decided to go. So now I'm like, oh, Jim, I, I don't know what to do. I said, I've, I've never written a novel. I don't know how to write a novel. I don't have any ideas for a novel. And he looked at me the way Jim looks at people, and he said, Tony, what did you always want to write about and never have? I said, Haunted House. Came to me real quickly. And he said, he pointed to me. He actually went, that's the novel you're going to write. And if you know Jim, you just listen to whatever he says. <laughs> so I said, okay. So the, the, uh, I went to the reading, the reading got done, and I ran home and I started work on a novel. Uh, and the opening, uh, uh, the, excuse me, the novel, I had it done in about three weeks, not the novel, but the, the, the submission. And uh, it became the opening to the Morehouse. It was the first chapter in the Morehouse. So I went to the class and I submitted it to Jim and to, to Chris and all the members of our little group. And uh, Chris thought it was just okay. Uh, a lot of redlining, like he always does, but a lot of redlining. My first beating, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jim had some suggestions that. Uh, the class was called How to Write Better. better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I needed to write better. Uh, but I, so I, it, when it was done, I was like very 
depressed. I said, man, I'm never going to be able to write a letter. What I wrote was junk. But a funny thing happened. All the members of the group, when these guys weren't around, <laughs> came up to me and they said, that was fantastic. That was really good. You got to keep on this. And they gave me the motivation. I mean, that was enough motivation from these guys, but they gave me the real motivation to keep going. Uh, and I, I said, okay. In fact, Mike's back there. He was, he was one of those guys that came up to me. Uh, in fact, he was the first guy that came up to me. So I'll forever thank you for that. Uh, but they came up to me and they said, you gotta do it. So I, I went back, I went back home and I continued to work on it. And uh, it took me a year to write it, uh, but I did. I, I wrote The Morehouse. Uh, so The Morehouse is done. I'm still writing some short stories. I get on Facebook and I said, hey, I just wrote this novel called The Morehouse. I haven't sent it anywhere yet, but I'm really proud of it. I really like it. And uh, John McElveen, a friend of mine, just started his press back up. It's called Haverhill House Press. And I mean, John's been around for a long time. He's published some of the greats and horror, you know, a lot of Chris's stuff he, he publishes. Uh, and he said, do you mind if I look at it? And I said, gosh, no, <laughs> I'll be more than happy. So I sent, uh, I sent John the, uh, the manuscript. So I'm waiting, <laughs> and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I don't hear anything. And I'm thinking, this is another Alabama Christmas. <laughs> then one day, I'm reading Facebook, and there's this uh, post from John. It's about Havel House, his publishing company. He says, oh, you know, we're doing great. We're having fun. We've got all these new books coming out, and we'd like to welcome new author Tony Tremblay in his book, The Morehouse. That's how I found out I was accepted. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> and they're like, what? What? And, and uh, I was just like jumping for joy, you know, because that's how he told me. So the, the, the Morehouse gets published. And a funny thing happened. <laughs> the Morehouse did very well. The day it was released, it was number two on the, on the horror charts on, on Amazon. Now you go, number two? How can you, you know, you can't complain about that. But I can. And the, the reason is, number one and number three were by some guy named Stephen King. <laughs> but, but, it wasn't the Stephen King. There was this guy with the same name. He wrote some really bad horror novels. <laughs> People didn't know. They just saw Stephen King in a title and they bought it. And they bought these things like crazy. And I was number two because a fake Stephen King knocked me out of number one. Uh, so I was really burned up about that. Well, what are you going to do? I mean, there's nothing you can do. And I don't know what happened to that guy, if he's still around. Uh, he's under your porch, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's now publishing as fake Tony Tremblay. Fake Tony Tremblay. <laughs> Doing very well, too, I hear. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, my God. So, But I was super happy. Uh, it, the reviews came in. The reviews were all positive. They were great. And it gets great review from uh, Chris. And uh, I was just super happy. Uh, it was doing well. And then it got nominated for a Bram Stoker Award. Uh, Bram Stoker Award is like the Oscars for the horror industry. Uh, they pick five books in a category, and then uh, they let the readers and the uh, judges that they choose pick the best of those five. In fact, Chris just won one for Air Rat. Uh, it's a very high honor, and congratulations again. Yes. That's a real good honor. <laughs> uh, is that the real Chris Gordon who wrote that? Yeah. <laughs> no, on, I definitely used that other guy. <laughs> yeah, he's under your porch, John. <laughs> uh, so I get nominated. So I, I'm super happy and pleased. So I run down to, I flew down to Michigan for the, uh, the ceremonies, and I'm waiting, I'm waiting, waiting. I get to my category, and they announced the winner, and it wasn't me. Uh, I was sad. I was, you know, I, everybody wants to win. And, didn't mean, you know, I was going to stop writing or anything, but it was nice to have been to one. But something good came out of it. I got to write down Oscar, uh, Oscar nominated. I got to write down Stoker nominated author of uh, The Morehouse. So it went on The Morehouse. It went on uh, Do Not Weep For Me, and it went on some other books. So once The Morehouse is out and it's doing very well, and it's still doing well, it still sells, you know, quite a few copies, I started work on a, a new book. And 
people are saying, hey, you know, you should do something about a, a sequel to The Morehouse. I didn't really want to do a sequel. I wanted to do something kind of different. But I liked a lot of the characters that were in The, uh, the Morehouse. So what I did is I wrote a book called Do Not Weep For Me that had the pawn shop owner and uh, Father <laughs> Bracken McLeod, uh, as well as a lot of new characters. And the new characters are really driving the plot uh, in the book. So then I'll just briefly go over what the book's about, because uh, I want to read a little bit from it later, and that might help you understand something from it. Uh, the book, the, the main, there's a lot of different threads, but the main thread is this guy named Paul. He's got this little girl named Cindy, and every day he takes her to work. His, his wife died, so he takes her to daycare while he goes to work. Uh, so one morning, uh, he says, you ready to go to daycare? And she says, can I go out in the swings out back first? And he goes, well, okay, I'll get the stuff in the car. You, uh, you know, go in the swing set and I'll come get you. So he goes to the car. He puts all his stuff in there. And as he's walking around the house to get to the back, he stops. There's something wrong. And he realizes what it is. He can't hear the squeaks of the chains on the swing set. He never oiled them. So you could hear it from all over the place, half the neighborhood. So now he's starting to panic. Uh, oh my God, he says, you know, I, please don't have make me messed up. Please don't make me have messed up. He runs to the other side of the house, looks, and Cindy's gone. Uh, and that starts a whole chain of events. Uh, just a little spoiler. Um, uh, while he's waiting out front while the uh, police are looking for Cindy, a woman comes up, an African-American woman. She says, uh, my daughter was also taken. Do you mind if I sit and wait with you while the police do something, just in case they have any clues for me? And uh, Paul says, yeah. They sit and they wait together and the relationship is formed. The spoiler is, they do find the two kids. But they've changed. And they brought something back with them. That's all I can tell you right now. Uh, but uh, it's not what you expect. Uh, there's some really uh, significant twists in there. And I'm going to read a little later on, just a small portion to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So, Do Not Weep For Me goes to the publisher. It goes to John. Something terrible happened. John's house caught on fire. Badly. He was kicked out of his house for a year. Yeah, almost, yeah it was almost two years before almost we two, moved back in. Almost yeah. two years. A terrible fire. Uh, in fact, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. You know, Chris calls, John's house is on fire. And, you know, he was shaken, I was shaken. They, they were at my house before it was, it was finished burning. They uh -huh. to help Yeah, them. we ran down to help him. I mean, we were just so nervous, so scared for John. Uh, but his house burnt down. So what that means is, do not weep for me is delayed. And I can understand that. I mean, anybody would. You say, hey, look, you know, he's not only is he a friend, but even if he wasn't a friend, he's in trouble. So you've got to support him. So now I'm waiting for John to get his business back together. I say, you know, I really want to get another book out there. So I collected 20 more stories that I wrote. And I called up the Davids uh, at Crossroad Press. They did the first book. And I said, uh, you guys interested in another collection? And they said, love it, love to. So I, I sent them the stories. And they released my second collection, second uh, volume of collections, Blue Stars and Other Tales of Darkness. Blue Stars came out. And the day it was released, it was, uh, it was the top ten in uh, horror anthologies for a day. And after that, sales started to go down. It did not do as well as the Seeds of Nightmares. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I was a little disappointed. I mean, people enjoyed it, but the reviews weren't there. Uh, it just didn't have the buzz that the Seeds of Nightmares had. And there were some excellent stories in there, so I'm not sure what happened. I have two theories, and both of them may be way out of whack. But the, the first thing I think is, the uh, first story, called Steel, is a novella. It's a long, long story. So when you open the book, you got this long story to read. And it's uh, science fiction. It's not really horror. So I think people that read the Morehouse, that read the first collection, got to steal and said, hmm, no, this ain't horror. So it didn't get the word of mouth that uh, the other books did. 
Secondly, look at this cover. It's very dark. If you're on a phone, if you're on a tablet, and you're looking at books, and this comes up, you're going to give it a second look? Probably not. Uh, a book's cover is so important, you just look at it and you go, oh man, I want this. Or it, it's, it, even if you don't want it, if it attracts you, that's what you want the, the, uh, as a publisher, the reader, to, 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 to at least look at it. And this didn't, I don't think, did that. Uh, and it's my fault. You know, I approved it. I let it go. Uh, Blue Stars did okay. I mean, it didn't do as good as the Seeds and Nightmares. I still get checks on the Seeds and Nightmares, but the ones for Blue Stars are very small. Uh, but that's okay. You know, I mean, that's the way it goes. And hopefully my next collection will do even better. Yeah. So now, now I'm waiting for John to, he's getting close. He's telling me that, uh, you know, hey, do not wait for me. You should be out in about another eight months. So now, okay. Uh, and I'm at Nikon again, a different Nikon. I mean, the same convention, but a different year. And I'm sitting with a gentleman by the name of Charles Rutledge. And we got to talking a little bit. We got to be friends. And later on on Facebook, Charles and I were talking about these wooden trains I make. I make terror trains, horror trains. And they got Dracula, or skeletons, gnomes, whatever. And they're all black. And there's a caboose and an engine and a middle part. And Charles said, Boy, you know, I really like scary train stories. I wish there was an anthology of scary train stories. And I said, yeah, me too. You know, I've never seen one. And he says, well, if there was one, I'd write a story for it. And I said, you know what? I'd write a story for one too. So we get to talking back and forth. Then we, I, I made a mention of, I said, you know what? This all sounds really good, but without a publisher, you know, we're not going to get anywhere with it. Funny thing happened. <laughs> John McElveen saw the post. And John gets on and he says, I will publish that for you. But I'm still rebuilding. If you do all the work, also all I have to do is submit it and get it printed, I'll publish it for you. So we talked and uh, said, yeah, you know, we, we can do that. We, we needed another, co another editor. You always should have an odd number of editors. And, Scott Goswell's very odd, so uh, <laughs> Scott came on board. <laughs> so the three of us put together Fright Train, and by doing all the work, uh, that means we contacted all the authors, uh, paid all the authors, did the cover art, paid for the cover art, and did all the editing ourselves. So handed that to John, John published it. Freight Train came out. I believe it was number 18 on the day it came out in the uh, horror anthology charts. So it didn't get in the top 10. Uh, but it didn't stay there that long either. Uh, Freight Train has done all right. Uh, we kind of knew it would be a niche thing because not everybody likes trains. Uh, anthologies are a hard sell anyways. I'm sorry? Anthologies are a hard sell. And that's the other thing. Uh, it, people just, there's so many anthologies out there. There's every kind you can name. But uh, ours did well, and uh, it broke even. It just about broke even, and there's still time to go. But if you're ever looking for an anthology <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you like trains, Freight Train uh, is great. I mean, there's some unbelievable authors in this, uh, some of the best, uh, you know, classic authors. Chris Golden's in it. <laughs> in fact, Chris's story's so good, it's the uh, anchor uh, for the... Uh, anthology. It's that good. Uh, Scott's got one in there. I've got one in there. It's a great book of stories. I think you'll, you'd really enjoy it, whether you like trains or not. Uh, it's, it's very good. So now, about, I don't know, six, seven months go by, and Do Not Weep For Me comes out. When it was released, I looked at the charts, and it was in the top hundred of all Amazon books, not just horror, but all Amazon books when it was released. And I was stunned. I was just like, this is crazy. Now, it didn't last long, <laughs> but it got to that point. Uh, and I want to say it was like 57 or something. I can't remember the exact number, but it was really, it did very well on that first day. Uh, it's still going. It's still too new to tell you how it's going to turn out. Uh, but there are a lot of copies sold. Reviews are coming in. 
Uh, I'm happy with it. I think John's happy with it. Uh, and I'm praying that Chris Golden's blurb on the front <laughs> sells even more copies. Uh, and I love the blurb. He wrote, Tony Trumpley writes the kind of horror I grew up on, full of ghosts, sex, demons, and unrelenting evil. He's having as much fun as his readers and his shows. And I thought that was a great blurb. Uh, the biggest difference between Do Not Weep For Me and the uh, aforementioned The Moore House is that the follow-up has a lot more adult content. So a lot it, easier to edit it. <laughs> uh, and I was a little nervous about that. I said, oh, geez, are people going to you know, have a problem with all that? Uh, I keep calling it adult content because this is being recorded for uh, television. And I'm not sure the three-letter word would go over too well. So I'll, I'll just say adult content. Uh, but I was a little nervous about it. I said, oh, geez. But everybody I've heard from says, no, it's not, you know, it's not too much. Uh, the the Adult content is not gratuitous. Uh, it's important to the plot. Uh, so there's a reason for it being there. Um, and I was at another very, it was a private group that I was speaking to about three weeks ago. And I was comparing the two novels. And I mentioned that the new one had adult content. All their eyes lit up. They smiled. <laughs> uh, and when it came time at the end when I sold books, guess which book sold the most? <laughs> so I, I, I think I was... I was worried for nothing. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to read to you just a very small portion of Do Not Weep For Me. Uh, it's only three pages, two and a half pages. Uh, read the adult content. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's the other 220 yeah. pages. Yeah. yeah, it's all the other pages except for these three. <laughs> Uh, and I, I explained, I gave you a, a, a little heads up on what I was going to talk, uh, what this is about earlier when I explained uh, one of the themes. And, and I'm just going to read to you what I, what I told you. Paul Lane glanced at the thermometer on his front porch, 74 degrees. And then, cup of coffee in hand, stood on concrete steps. He noticed a thick cloud cover. Its gray hue muted the sunshine dulling the vibrant palette of the season. He looked down and frowned. The grass covering his yard looked different. The stiff, neatly trimmed blades rested limply on the topsoil. The deep shamrock green had faded. Its tips tinged with yellow. It's too tired looking for mid-June. The neighborhood had taken on a dingy appearance. It was as if the brick, aluminum, and vinyl siding facades on the homes had bathed in a layer of dust. Not one of the new cars screamed, look at me. Their wax jobs lack sparkle. Their chrome trim, chrome trims dull. <coughs> Excuse me. Something was off. People in this neighborhood had pride. They were not known for neglecting their property. Daddy? The call broke his concentration. Yes, Cindy. Can I play on the swing for a few minutes before you take me to school? Paul didn't answer. There was a heaviness to the area he couldn't put his finger on. The atmosphere had weight. Not only was it oppressive, it was concerning in a way that defied easy description. He caught sight of Sheila White, the neighbor across the street. She retrieved the daily newspaper from the box at the end of her driveway. The woman waved to him, and he waved back. She was a fine-looking woman, and she knew it. He smiled when she stopped a few feet from her front door and wiggled her ass before stepping back inside. Paul's wife had been dead for four years now, but that didn't mean he was. Though Sheila often flirted with him, she was off limits. He and her husband Tom were still good friends, and he would never betray that trust. Still, she did brighten Paul's mood on occasion. Daddy, can I? Huh? He had forgotten about Cindy. Yeah, sure, honey. Stay in the back. I'll come get you when it's time to leave. You want to eat, want to eat anything before you have a breakfast? Before you go to daycare and have breakfast? No, I'm okay. Can you push me? He chuckled. Sure, give me a minute to bring my stuff to the car. I'll be right out. Thanks, Daddy. She gave him a quick hug and ran back inside. He followed her in, and after chugging his coffee, Paul draped a suit coat over his arm and grabbed his brief briefcase and backpack. There was a thud, 
confirming his daughter had gone through the back door to get to the swing set. The forecast promised clear weather, so he left his car in the driveway overnight. He walked to the Lexus with thoughts of that morning's meeting he had planned with his company's engineers. He made a mental note to review the cost analysis of the retrofit on the South Willow Street strip mall in Manchester. Lost in thought, he threw his suit coat and briefcase onto the rear seat. At the shutting the door, he made an effort to clear his head and attend to Cindy. He walked past an area of tall pines and scrub that marked the property line on the right side of his house. When he was about to turn the corner to the backyard, he slowed. This, this doesn't feel right. He should have heard squeaks from the rusty trains attached to the joints at the top of the swing set. He meant to oil them, but he had never found the time. The squeaks were annoying, loud. You could hear them from 20 feet away. His back stiffened and he hurried his pace. <sighs> she, she could be sitting and not swinging. Maybe she went back into the house. God, please, don't let me have messed up. He rounded the corner. The swing was empty. Cindy was nowhere in sight. And then it gets really bad. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I think I've taken up enough of your time, but I do really appreciate you all coming. Uh, if you want to ask me some questions, now's the time to do it. Um, how do you manage the um, negative reviews with social media and everything? I cry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't take them well. I, I, uh, Even though I, you, I mean, you, know, you must know that a lot of people just do it to troll. Right? Yeah, I do, and you can tell the trolls sometimes depending on what they write. Uh, I just, uh, I, I do have a hard time with negative reviews. Uh, I guess it's my personality. I take it to heart. Uh, on the Morehouse, one person wrote this review on uh, Goodreads. And I never read Goodreads because it's just terrible stuff uh, that people write. But I, I went on to see what people were saying. It's like Yelp. Yeah. Books. What's that? It's like Yelp, but for books. But for books. <laughs> and uh, this woman wrote, oh my God, a house that eats people. No way I'm reading this. And I'm like, oh. you know, she missed the whole point of the story in the first place. Uh, but Did she even read it? No. Nothing. No. Why are you putting a review No, up? no. And it's just, it was, and she gave it one star. And, you know, it brings all the other reviews down. Uh, but, you know, it's still, the book still had a 4.8 yeah. out of 5. So I, I can't complain. But I, I don't take them well. I mean, I, I never reply. You should never reply to a, a, a bad review. Uh, I just wondered because it's such personal water. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to tell you that I grabbed Seeds of Nightmare downstairs because it was just in my face, and I read mostly horror, and I had nightmares every single night that I read that book. It was last summer. It's every, not the photo, right? <laughs> it had nothing to do with the cover. It had to do with the, the stories. Every single night it took me so like did its job. four <laughs> nights to read it, and I had a nightmare. I personally like having nightmares, but like every single night that I read it, I had a nightmare. Well, as Sandy it said, it job. did its job. That's great. Yes. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, that's welcome. a good review. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, that's, that's quite a compliment. Yes, well, it I is. Did, I, I did it during the adult program here at the library, so I did do oh, a wow. review on it. So. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Yes. I didn't know it was part of the adult program here. Thank you. <laughs> well, well, no, I mean, like, you had to read, like, a bunch of books. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. And I don't read anything else. Like but horror, horror huh? Crime. Okay. <laughs> Do you know there's a new horror book called Do Not Wait For Me? I, yeah. I, 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 I like the pawn shop owner in the Moore house, so. Oh, you did? Excited, yeah. But he's got a much bigger role in this one, yeah. so. Yeah. We're your spokesmodels. I guess so, yeah. I have to take my shirt off. <laughs> Go ahead. God, no. <laughs> so, you know, uh, this is a serious question, even though you're going to wince at the opening of it, which is that, uh, you know, you have earned a reputation as one of the nicest guys in the horror community. Uh, and I know you hate when we say, Tony <laughs> Tremblay is the nicest guy in horror. Um, but there is, it is such an interesting dichotomy that, that horror, the horror community has a reputation for being kind. Yes. Yes. Uh, and so I, it's interesting that you have a reputation for being so nice and your work is so dark that it gave this poor woman nightmares every <laughs> night. Just in general, like, 
you know, what, where, where do you, I don't want to say where do you get your ideas, but like, how do you sort of rationalize, rationalize that dichotomy between daily life of horror writers and then all the nightmares? Well, it, it, it's even, you could go further than that. My wife is a born again Christian, so I live with that every day. And I write, well, while she's listening to the Bible, I'm over there. <laughs> <laughs> writing about the devil, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I read the Old Testament, uh, and that scared the crap out of me. Oh, yeah. And I loved being scared. Uh, and the, the more violent, you know, the more uh, uh, gory and, and horrific the stories were, the more I enjoyed them. And I was just a young kid. And that feeling I got when I read them never left. Uh, now, I never took these seriously. And like you, when you write books, you don't expect people to, you know, do what's in your books. I mean, they're not, you know, meant for that. They're meant for release, you know, not to copy and not to mimic. So when I write these things, uh, I'm in a good place usually. I'm just trying to get back to where I was when I was a kid and when I got scared. And I'm thinking what scared me then still scares me now. And so that's what I write. And and if if you write a scene and you get so excited about it, I know you do, uh, you just feel good, you know, you just feel good. Uh, and I, I don't know if that's answered your question or not, but that's, that's, that's what I do, that's how I feel. You mean there's not a house in Gosstown that eats people? There is. She asked if there's a house in Gosstown that eats people. <laughs> there is. And just don't let him invite you over. Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say I'll, I'll talk to you later. Where it is? <laughs> yeah, yeah um, you said you wrote some some sci-fi. Do you like horror better than sci-fi, or I do. is it a toss-up? Yeah, uh, I don't understand sci-fi that well. And the story I wrote, Steel, is a sci-fi story with horrific elements. I mean, there's a lot of horror in in Steel. Uh, the biggest problem I have with sci-fi is I a lot of times I don't understand it. Uh, I'm just not a nerd. I, I can't get, grasp those. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't grasp those concepts. But the biggest problem I have with sci-fi are the names. If I need a, a protractor and uh, a pencil paper, a, a piece of paper and pencil to write everybody's name down so I can remember them, or if I can't pronounce them, mm. I just don't enjoy reading those kind of books. Uh, so I bypass them. And I know you can write sci-fi. He wrote Tin Man, which I consider a sci-fi book, which was thoroughly enjoyable. Um, I'm going to give you a check later, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> well, you showed up. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, that's the problem I have with, with sci-fi. And there's a lot of, like, Bray, Ray Bradbury is one of my favorite authors. Uh, but he made it so you could read his stuff. Uh, you know, everybody could read his stuff. You didn't have to be a nerd. You didn't have to really be into science to understand it. I'm sorry? It's not hard sci-fi, it's human element. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, Mike. Uh, this is a little nut, nuts and bolts uh, about publishing anthologies, but you, know, you had mentioned you thought that maybe because Steel was the opening story uh, that it, that book might not have sold as well as your first book of short stories. Who decides what order they go in and what, what goes into those decisions? Mm -hmm. about Boy, <laughs> I, I think it's different for everybody. Uh, I know with, uh, in my case, I suggested which stories go first. Uh, I love Steel. I thought it was a great story. So I, I suggested it, that it go first. And I, I take, like I said, I take the blame that the, the, the book came out as it did. Uh, would have been better in the end where, you know, all the scary stories came first and uh, kind of wormed your way up, worked your way up to the uh, sci-fi story. I don't know. I don't know, but yeah, every every publisher's different. I don't know how other people do it. How do you decide in freight uh, freight train? What order this? Like, is it like a the way bands decide up songs to go in order on their albums? You know, I, mean, yeah. I would think you'd want to have some kind of. Yeah, S Scott can back me up on this, but uh, it was committee. We went over every story, and we knew which we knew which stories we wanted to start and end. That was unanimous. We just said, you know. Uh, Chris's story has to anchor it, and Bracken McLeod's story has to start it. Uh, we knew that. And then we had to decide what order the other stories go. Uh, when you have your own story in an anthology that you're doing, 
it gets kind of messy because you, you know you want yours in the front, uh, but you know you you almost say, well, I'll put mine in the middle just to be fair and let somebody else go. But we had so many good stories; it was tough. And we would Scott, myself, and Charles would we had quite a few discussions on what order to put them in. But we we agreed. We at the end we were all very satisfied uh, with the way we chose them. Tony, your writing practice, is there any time of day that you usually write, or is it when, when do you write? When I feel like it. Uh, that, and, <laughs> I mean, it could be, I mean, I, I usually get up, I have breakfast, I'll do something around the house, and then depending on what time I get up, uh, it could be 9, you know, I, uh, it could be 5.30 in the morning, uh, it could be 6.30, it could be 7.30, I'm retired, I can do what I want. Uh, which is nice, but after I eat breakfast, I'll do an item, a, an odd job, something, uh, just to wake up, to get the gears going. When I've done that, then I'll go to the computer and I'll sit down and I'll write. I'm the kind of guy that, that writes, I don't sit down and say, I'm going to write 400 words today. I write whatever comes out. And I'm a slow writer because I constantly edit myself. After I've done a page, I go back and I redo that page. And sometimes I'll do that, re I'll re go over that page four or five times. So it's a real slow process. And you know, all these experienced authors will tell you, don't do that. Keep writing, just keep writing. Uh, I haven't been able to do that. What about when you were working? I'm sorry? What about when oh, you were that's a good question. <laughs> when I was working, I did it. Brian Keene, who's a very uh, famous author, has done a lot of good books. Uh, came on the old Horror World website that I was talking about. And he says, if you're working, you still have time to do something. You could do it during your breaks. You can do it during lunchtime. You can do it before you go to work. You can do it after you go to work. And I took that advice to heart. And at work during my breaks, I would write for 10, 15 minutes. During my lunch break, I would be writing while I was eating lunch. Uh, and I come home at night, I do a little. And in the morning, you know, sometimes before work, I would do a little. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, you know, when I was working, work and family was priority. Are you ever going to res um, resurrect that story when spiders eat my face? <laughs> <laughs> my father hated it so much, it just left a scar on me. <laughs> There's no way. I'm glad she said that because I thought the same thing when you mentioned it. Like, I wonder what grown-up Tony yeah. would right? produce oh. yeah. if you tried to do, do a novella. <laughs> because that title, I'd buy it just from the title alone. I would take my father's face. Spiders, 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 spiders ate my father's face. Yeah. 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 Even better. You could do an anthology of all your oh, friends spiders. writing a story no, about, about spiders, spiders eating faces. <laughs> well, now we know what you're going to write next. Uh, it's funny, I'm working on something now. I'm not having a lot of luck with it. Uh, I've, I've, three or four times now I've written four or five chapters and I've rewritten them. I'm just having a hard time, so what I might do is put it aside. Uh, you know, another idea came to me that I like, and I'll probably start that. But I was talking, I think I was talking to, to Chris, that what I might do is um, write novellas, write four novellas, and then hopefully John will look at those novellas <laughs> and say, yeah, that'll make a good book. Um, and I've, got, I've actually got a novella John's had for about five years now. <laughs> And it's called, What Does It Mean to Be a Woman? Now, that title alone, I think, would make people very uh, curious as to what the content is. So that novella is done. Uh, I've got another novella that's done. Uh, Way to stick your neck out. Tom. I know. Yes, yeah, I know. No, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Not just your neck, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I sent a novella to Jim Moore, so now I've got two novellas that I could possibly use, and that means I've got to write two more. And I might do that, uh, and then go back to the novel. Uh, but we'll see. Spiders ate my face. Spiders ate my face. <laughs> yeah. So, Blue Stars, do you ever consider republishing it with a different cover? Yeah, John has uh, talked to me about... Uh, Combining, yeah. well, combining the two into an omnibus, uh, om, om, omnibus, omnibus, omnibus. omnibus. Yes. Uh, in, including some other stories as well. Yeah. And I think uh, the best Tony so far. 
<laughs> and that might be uh, that might be something that uh, we look at. Yeah. Because mm. I know in the genre I write or try to write, it is common. It's like covers change all the time. So yeah. if that cover didn't do it. Boom, pop it out with a different cover. Yeah. yeah. And see if it if it gets. Sandy writes oh. romance, by the way. Yeah. Some speculative sci-fi romance, too, yeah, on top of that, yeah. Mm. Anybody else? No, thank you. Oh. Um, you mentioned earlier that you incorporate um, actual friends' names and such into your work. Um, what kind of, um, of process is that? Do you get permission first? Uh, do they get to review the uh, the work before it comes out? What, what's the whole process with incorporating those folks? In the Morehouse I asked every single person whose name I used for permission. Uh, and they all gave it. There's not one person that said no. In Do Not Weep For Me I asked every person except one. And that one person was Christopher Golden. <laughs> I didn't ask for his permission, I just put his name in there because I didn't think he would mind. Wait till you see the letter from my attorney. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good character, though. So, and aside from Chris, has there been any negative feedback? <laughs> no. In fact, uh, every character that I've used where I've gotten permission, the people have loved the character. They've all been either killed off uh, or, you know, they're... So no, you. That's right. Sandy. Sandy has a major part in a few of my uh, books. She's also in Do Not Weep for Me. Um, but no, she hasn't been killed off. <laughs> Robert Perot back there also features very prominently in a story called Blue Stars. As Sandy. Uh, in fact, I wrote Blue Stars with those two people in mind. And Blue Stars did so well. Uh, it got a nomination for uh, an Alan Dotlow uh, recommended reading. Uh, uh, Novus or whatever she calls it. So, uh, very, very happy with that. So, buy Blue Stars and make me happy. Get those numbers up. <laughs> and do not weep for me. Yes. <laughs> and Fright Train. And Fright Train, yes. Got all those already. Uh, any other questions? Thank you very much. I hope Thank I didn't take you. up too much of your time. <laughs> Thank you.